They're just wanting to know. They want to learn. I was learning about myself through a lens that I didn't really understand or um, think portrayed me very accurately. Louis Real said our people will sleep for a hundred years, and when they awake, it's their artists that will give them their spirit back. I've seen many people in that kind of next generation or the generation afterwards, such as mine, uh, begin taking up that fight and taking up those, those truths. We need them to be our next generation of our leaders. If those things happen, reconciliation becomes a natural byproduct. This weight is lifted from my shoulders. I feel like I am where I belong. Welcome. Can't say everyone. We're here at the Forks in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. The original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ, Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Now we are here at Odena Circle. Now Odena is Ojibwe for heart of the community, a fitting place to begin. I'm Taylor Brock. And I'm Nelson Bird. The Forks has been a gathering place for Indigenous people for thousands of years. Today it is a meeting place for everyone. Over the next hour we'll look at the next generation as we look at the history of Indigenous people and how young people are leading the way forward. We'll hear stories of discovery, collaboration and a sense of pride from across the country. Reconciliation and reconnecting the path forward. A CTV News National Day for Truth and Reconciliation special. For well over a century, Indigenous people have endured extreme oppression when it comes to culture and life in general. Much of the real history was not taught in schools, but passed on through generations, and many of those experiences were foretold over a century ago. Prophecies that were common among Indigenous people across much of North America. There is a popular phrase among Indigenous people and it has everything to do with learning and the sharing of knowledge. It is said, education is the new buffalo, alluding to the fact buffalo allowed the ancestors to survive, as will education. Audrey Drever sees it daily. She teaches Indigenous art history at the First Nations University in Regina. I get students from all over the world, including settler students, and they are they're just wanting to know. They want to learn. The majority of her students are Indigenous and part of a generation prophesied to change the world, at least for Indigenous people. In the late 1800s and earlier, spiritual leaders predicted what's known as the seventh generation prophecies. One of those visionaries was Crazy Horse. So he went on a vision quest and that's where he's seeing the prophecies and what's going to happen. Drever is aware of the prophecies and sees the proof all around her. They're making a difference. They're finding ways and they're making ways. They're opening doors. They're taking their places in our communities and in government buildings and educational institutions and business uh, places and like all these different sectors. Students like Judy Missens will soon be among them. She's still in high school, but as she and her mom walk the hallways of the university, the faces of the grads on the wall has her thinking about her own future. I want to expand all of my interests and learn more about everything and about other cultures, other people, and just about everything. She may be part of a long-held prophecy, but Judy is not alone. In fact, the predictions can be interpreted in many ways. Drever favors one particular prophecy where all past and current generations work towards bettering the lives of those seven generations ahead. It's making everyone responsible for what's coming, not putting all of the burden and the blame if it doesn't happen on the one generation. It was never easy for those who helped pave the way for today's youth, and they don't have it easy either. Social issues stemming from intergenerational trauma exist, but there is a common goal, and that is to get back to a pre-contact way of thinking and living. Our young people, I think, are taking us back to that place. I would like to see myself just doing something good 
for everything and everyone. Call it prophecy or a prediction, the reality is young people have waited and watched. Now it's their time, and like the buffalo, they are here to stay and flourish while making sure Indigenous culture never disappears. Nelson Bird, CTV News, Regina. For one in teen, youth play an important role in advancing reconciliation in Canada. The teen was in Iqaluit when the Pope apologized on home soil, but he says the action doesn't end there. Here's CTV's Leah LaRock. Amigos. Mami Anak. Mami Anak, the Anuktitut word for sorry, something Michael Semertuk has been waiting to hear for his family, his culture, and his future. It felt like I had a weight off my chest and like felt like I let go of something that happened to my family. Ay, 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 ay. Samar took volunteer to help with the Pope's visit to Iqaluit, where Pope Francis apologized for the role the Catholic Church played in residential schools. La indignación y la vergüenza. Someone of high power is saying sorry about this is going to be really relieving for a lot of people. Raised in Rankin Inlet, Samortuk now lives in Ottawa. The 14-year-old says his grandparents were survivors, but he only learned about it after his grandfather passed away. It makes me feel a little sad because I didn't think of asking if he was okay or anything. He says his generation has not escaped the trauma. Us losing our language, losing family members with a lot of stress and not being able to let go of this. But Summer Tuck says there is still a long way to go in reconciliation, but he says that young people just like him play an important role. He says he wants to advocate for better access to health care, cleaner drinking water, and better housing for his community. Donate, that would be awesome because not a lot of people get food because of how high the prices are here. Samar Tuck says his goal is to teach Inuit culture and language through his art. I want to uh, allow people to have the mindset that they could let go. Maybe raising money to get it taught in schools, to talk about it, to have shows about it and stuff. Spreading words of hope for a community he is proud to be part of. It's good to move on from something, but it'll always be a bit a part of us. Leah LaRock, CTV News. A young generation with big dreams. In Quebec, some Indigenous communities are dealing with intergenerational trauma brought forth by residential schools, isolation and a controversial provincial law that could affect younger generations. But the younger generations are hopeful about what the future holds. CTV's Billy Shields now on remembering the past and looking forward to the future. For the first time ever, Concordia University's Indigenous Student Centre is holding a powwow. It's a way of showing um, our resilience as a people and that we're still here, we're still practicing our songs, we're still doing our dances, we're still cooking our food, and um, so that's really what a powwow is all about. The centre has been around for 30 years and they figured this would be a good way to mark the anniversary. And so I just hope that as they come here and hopefully get involved, they also start learning about our cultures and how much diverse and different we are. The powwow brings together nations from all over Quebec, Inuit, Mohawks, and Cree. What I hope for our future is that more, you know, our youth will become more educated. In Chisasabi, 1,500 kilometers from Montreal, Chief Daisy House says almost two-thirds of the community of 5,000 people are under the age of 30. And helping her community move forward is at the forefront of her goals. Part of that involves bringing up some painful memories. There are plans to use ground-penetrating radar to see if there are any unmarked graves at nearby Fort George Island, the location of the community's residential schools. These are first-hand accounts. They're, these are not hearsay. A lot of them are still alive. We have 80, 90-year-olds telling us stories, and we found the majority wanted to find out. 
find out the truth. This summer, the Pope came to Quebec City, where he issued an apology. One of the people who traveled to hear it was Carleton University student Allison McLeod of the Cree community of Mysticity. I found that the worst part was that the apology was not very much directed towards the survivors. Um, it was more directed towards the people who were in the room. Her grandmother, Alice, is a residential school survivor. The atrocities that happen in residential schools, may, they may not ever be forgiven, um, but at least there needs to be accountability and justice. Back in Gunawage, a complicated legacy looms over the town. Nonetheless, the Grand Chief says she's determined to take steps to move ahead. We could all dwell on, you know, the negative history that Indigenous people and the settlers have had in this region and this country and what we call Turtle Island, or we can say, all right, what does the future look like and how can we have better relations moving forward? And change, she says, is starting to happen. We're seeing now uh, land acknowledgements, things we didn't hear of 20 years ago, right? Yeah, I, I really see such a, a shift and a change now in people who want to be our allies. And she's not the only one who feels that way. We still have hope in spite of all these obstacles. That hope also rests with the younger generation. My generation is really just trying to heal what has happened and uphold also all the important values that our elders carried on throughout life. And they are hoping to take the next steps on a path forward that also respects their past. Billy Shields, CTV News, Montreal. Indigenous artists in London, Ontario are using their crafts to pay tribute to residential school survivors and the children who were lost. They have created a new set of murals to pay tribute and to break down stereotypes. CTV's Nick Paparel has more on the project. They are hoping to be acknowledged through their voices and their artwork. This large-scale mural, which is weeks in the making, is entitled We Are Still Here. It pays tribute to the children who were lost through Canada's residential school system and those who survived. Mary Ann Laforme is one of them. I'm glad that this is going ahead for the very simple reason that we need the world to know exactly what has been happening in their neck of the woods. She said as a child, if she wet the bed, there were harsh consequences. We had a set of stairs on both girls' side and boys' side where there was nothing under the stairs uh, and they would put you in there for punishment. So I would be in there with my really wet, stinky sheets for a couple of days. No food, no water, no anything. Just little circles all around. Mary Ann is among the contributors, but the Indigenous designer and artist is Mike Sywink. I hope that it, um, again, kind of helps abolish some of those negative stereotypes you hear about Indigenous people. I hope that it makes people want to learn a little bit more about Indigenous culture. Mike says he's hoping the seven large murals address several aspects. Indigenous teachings, um, uh, things about reconciliation, uh, resiliency, um, the Indigenous aspect of life and the way that we view the world. When the seven murals are completed, they'll go up here on the side of the Namarin Center at Horton and Coburn. They're expected to be unveiled on September 30th. The 30th will mark the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Mary Ann is hoping the murals will help provide more healing. That people will see the promise of a, a better future, that all nations will come together as the Creator meant for us to be, like we are in our uh, beliefs, we are all family. We, everyone is our brothers and sisters. Okay, and Mother Earth is our Mother Earth. Nick Paparella, CTV News. Moving truth and reconciliation forward takes strength and leadership. A group of young people in Winnipeg are showing that that strength can be found at any age. Youth for Truth and Reconciliation is made up of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous young people. They meet each week to discuss what reconciliation means to them, sharing their own cultures and experiences. The group works to draw attention to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action, many of which have not yet been implemented seven years after the report's release. As a second generation immigrant myself, I know a lot of the stereotypes that uh, you know my parents have uh, from what they've learned from other new immigrants. Uh, and you know what they see on the streets, but that's certainly not the truth, right? 
Uh, so by bringing the youth together and you know we are having this discussion and then we take that discuss with, with our parents you know the, the dinner table you know this is what I learned about the history of indigenous peoples you know uh, the assimilations the 60 scoops the residential schools and then you know and then how connecting that to what we see uh, in the current news and the current events. The group of 15 to 30 year olds spends much of their time focused on this day truth and reconciliation day but their impact goes beyond one day a year. Their work includes practical ways to do reconciliation work, including honoring the lives lost in residential schools and hosting a clothing drive. We all share the land together. We are all one large community and I think it's very important to know the people who you are sharing this land with your, and who you're living with. So your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues. I just think it's very important to understand the people of Canada and its history. As older generations pass on, the work of preserving Indigenous language and culture increasingly falls on the shoulders of the youth. Students at Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie are doing its part to continue working towards truth and reconciliation. The institution is housed in a former residential school and the Indigenous Student Union is using the space which holds trauma for many as an opportunity to educate. CTV's Mike McDonald reports. <laughs> Nina Trudeau is the president of the Shingwak Anishinaabe Students Association at Algoma University. The institution maintains an exhibit on its history as a residential school, complete with testimonials of former students and even a marker for a crawl space under a stairwell where students would often hide. Trudeau's association with Algoma goes well beyond her years as her grandfather attended when it was a residential school. I know there's a lot of mixed emotions behind having to pay tuition to get our language and our culture back but at the same time that's one step forward of something that my grandfather never had so where they took the language and the culture from him I now have the opportunity to take it back. As a young girl Trudeau remembers listening to her grandparents speaking Anishinaabe Moen to each other she is now learning the language. Following the recent apology from Pope Francis on the Catholic Church's role in Canada's residential schools Trudeau feels it was a hollow gesture. Pretty words. He did what he needed to do to essentially uh, shut us up and to stop bugging the Pope about truth and reconciliation and about his apology. Coulter Asinawe, a recent Algoma graduate who now works for the university, says the fight for truth and reconciliation is gradually being passed on to younger generations. I've seen many people in that kind of next generation or the generation afterwards, such as mine, uh, begin taking up that fight and taking up those those truths, those very hard truths. Those, those family members and those relatives, those elders that do want to share their stories, they stick with us. We remember those stories and we remember how to tell them. Among the objectives of the Shingwak Anishinaabe Students Association is to strengthen cultural awareness between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. The vice president of the association says it's important for members to celebrate who they are. We don't want them to be shy and withheld. We want them to be able to speak freely and know that they can. We need them to be our next generation of our leaders. And Trudeau says Indigenous youth should express pride in their culture by any means they see fit. If you only know one word in the language, that's fine, use it and use it every day. If you show your pride by wearing your beadwork and your ribbon skirts, then keep doing that. Mike McDonald, CTV News, Sault Ste. Marie. Still to come, the push to preserve language. We have less than 8,000 speakers left in the world. Protecting a piece of culture at the risk of extinction. And a reporter rediscovers his indigenous roots. I am so happy to be home. The decades long journey to find family and connect with culture. Eskimotin means thank you, I am grateful to you in Cree. Keen and Eskimotin. Miigwetch is how you say thank you in Ojibwe. Miigwetch. Here in the heart of Winnipeg is where the Assiniboine and the Red River meet. This space is called Nizo's Eye Bean, which in Ojibwe means two rivers. For thousands of years, people have traveled from three directions to gather on these grounds to trade, grow, and celebrate. The area is rich in collaboration, where current and future generations still continue to gather. 
We turn now to a decades-long journey to find family. Last year, while reporting on the unmarked graves in Kamloops, CTV's Ben Milger shared with viewers that he is an Indigenous man. And that set him on a path of rediscovery. CTV's Mi Jung Lee follows him as he connects with his culture and big family for the first time. From Vancouver, it takes all day to get to Alert Bay off the northern tip of Vancouver Island. For Ben Milger, it's taken his whole life. I was of concern that I would feel like an outsider. No charges are being considered. As a journalist, CTV's Ben Milger is used to asking other people questions, but when it came to his Indigenous heritage and family, there were questions he could not answer. That would have been very awkward and embarrassing for me. So instead, I just avoided those conversations. He no longer wants to avoid those conversations. Ben has made the trip to Alert Bay for a Cook family reunion. He's a descendant of a large Indigenous family. Ben didn't know his family because he grew up in and out of foster care. Getting that sense of belonging has never been easy. Those emotions surfaced last year when he was covering the discovery of the unmarked graves at the site of a former Kamloops residential school. Some sing, some cry, others stare in stoic silence at 215 pairs of shoes. The biggest void in Ben's life was his mother, Elizabeth Hill. She struggled on the streets and for 21 years her family had no idea where she was. Finally, her sister and Ben's aunt, a lawyer, testified at the inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And that reopened the investigation. And then we were able to find the exam when the investigation was done properly. She was living in a Toronto care home after suffering a brain injury. Ben made the trip out to see her. The Namgis Big House is the cultural gathering hub here in Alert Bay. It's also where the large Cook family is about to welcome home one of its own. And eventually, we all come home. They present Ben with a special vest. We're going to cover him so that we wrap that supernatural around you. We welcome you home. I have this sense of relief. This weight is lifted from my shoulders. I feel like I am where I belong. I am so happy to be home. An outsider no longer. Mi Jung Lee, CTV News, Alert Bay. Indigenous youth are rediscovering their cultures through languages, art, and more. Advocate Michael Redhead Champagne is helping us discover what's next. So Michael, when it comes to looking at youth right now, how are you seeing them rediscover and really embrace their Indigenous heritage? Uh, the big thing I'm hearing from Indigenous young people, there are two main focuses that I'm hearing from them. Uh, one is the importance of family and having access to, and connection to a family of choice or a, their own family. Uh, the other thing I'm hearing from young people is the importance of connecting to the land and language. And so it's beautiful for us to be here uh, in such a beautiful space having this interview today. So when it comes to young people who are, you know, looking at family and things like that, what specifically are you seeing people do? I see a lot of young people that are working hard to learn their language, get connected to ceremony. Um, other things I'm seeing young people do include volunteering and helping to support others that are experiencing similar challenges. So I see a lot of Indigenous young people that are volunteering to help change the challenges that them and their peers are facing. So then it's a lot of young people who are both rediscovering and taking leadership roles. Yes, I see right now it feels like it's a moment for Indigenous youth where they are reclaiming in a very forceful and appropriate way their language, their identity and pieces of their culture. So when it comes to you know, the future, whether that be in a couple years or even 10 years, how do you see Indigenous youth really reclaim and, as you say, share their cultures? I see Indigenous young people in the coming years being the strong leaders that we needed yesterday. I see Indigenous young people uh, taking on those difficult challenges about addressing challenges relating to child welfare, related to cultural revitalization. And I imagine these Indigenous young people are going to be doing things that allow more and more families and individuals to reconnect with the land, whether that's here in the city or in rural or uh, reserve environments. So what do you think the biggest thing the average person in this country could see when it comes to these youth taking up these leadership roles? 
I think what Canada can expect when Indigenous young people are given leadership opportunities is they can expect unapologetic truth-telling. I see young people not sugarcoating things anymore, they're saying things how they are. And I think that that uncomfortable uh, moment when folks are hearing the truth that Indigenous young people have to say is discomfort that we have to lean into as a country. I think that's where the learning happens. Where do you think they're getting the strength to say those kinds of things from? I believe Indigenous young people are getting the strength to be the leaders that they're being today from the culture, from the language, from the land, from connecting to grandmothers and grandfathers and knowledge keepers that are sharing those teachings with those young people. With those teachings, these young people are equipped and able to take on some of these systems that are harming too many Indigenous people. Well, thank you very much for your time, Michael. Thank you very much for having me and highlighting the amazing talent of Indigenous young people. It's difficult, if not nearly impossible, to find schools where Indigenous languages are taught, but there are schools on reserve where teachers are trying to bring them back, but it can be an uphill battle with many obstacles to overcome. CTV's Ryan McDonald visited a Mi'kmaq immersion school in Nova Scotia to talk to some of the students and educators who are working hard to preserve a language with very few speakers left. It looks like a puppet show, but this is also a teaching tool and is part of a tireless effort to reclaim a language taken away in generations past. We have less than 8,000 speakers left in the world. Katani Julian is both ventriloquist extraordinaire and language and culture consultant here at the Mi'kmaq Immersion School in Eskazoni, the largest Mi'kmaq community east of Montreal. Piper is like a little old lady, if you mind the expression, but uh, she speaks at the uh, proficiency of an adult. But five-year-old Piper is the exception, not the rule. Does it feel like an uphill battle at times? Yes. The school's principal says many children come here with minimal or no background in their native language, and the biggest challenge she faces comes after the dismissal bell rings. When they get home, I don't know. You know, um, I think the language should be reinforced at home, but I'm not sure if that's happening. It sets a precedent for the other provinces, I'm hoping. Back in the summer, an historic proclamation was made, officially recognizing Mi'kmaq as Nova Scotia's first language. It's an act that officially becomes provincial legislation October 1st on Treaty Day. Our language will be visible and we're able to learn in all schools, not just Mi'kmaq schools, not just Mi'kmaq community, but the whole province. The hope now is the change in legislation will make a real tangible difference in schools and in communities. Meantime, back at the school in Eskazoni, as they continue to battle the loss of language, they're currently dealing with the loss of someone who was trying to help preserve it. She was very passionate with the Mi'kmaq language. We called her the Mi'kmaq warrior. Angie Stevens was a teacher here. She passed away suddenly September 12th. The principal says she worked that very day. We're going to honor her every day by um, speaking the language. When I do my announcements, that's what I add. Miss Angie would want you to speak Mi'kmaq, but in, in Mi'kmaq. But Mi'kmaq immersion here ends in grade three. School staff would like to see immersion become an option offered until a student graduates. Until then, Principal Denny says the importance of what you might call homework bears repeating. I would love to have the support at their homes. That's the most important, and that's what's missing here. That's the missing link. The future of our language rests with children like Piper. Without that support, educators are concerned that even a child as fluent as Piper could lose the language by the time she grows up. It's an uphill battle, but we're going to try. We're going to still try. We're not giving up. Ryan McDonald, CTV News, on the Eskazoni First Nation. The Red River Jig was used to attract fur traders to Métis colonies hundreds of years ago. Today, it is a symbol of Métis pride and resilience. And more and more young people are jumping to jig, including one family I spoke to who is jigging through the generations and the youngest jigger of them all. Hello, boy, jigger. At three years old, Alex Asham Rego was the youngest jigger to ever join his grandfather's Métis dance group, the Asham Stompers. Who taught you how to dance? 
Grandpa did. Me, when he was just a baby, I had him up on stage. Now at four years old, Alex puts his small feet to work during some of the Stompers shows. Because I'm going to jig and put on my outfit. Arnold Asham doesn't remember learning to jig, but knows his family has been jigging for generations. You know, we'd always go to Grandma's house and uncles and aunts and grandmas and grandpas would throw uh, money when the kids jigged. So. Arnold did not identify as Indigenous until he was in his late 20s. Well, my dad would never admit we are Indigenous. Uh, at those days, it was shameful. After embracing his Indigenous identity 50 years ago, Arnold championed Métis heritage, later creating both the World Jigging and Indigenous Square Dancing Championships. Louis Riel said our people will sleep for 100 years, and when they awake, it's their artists that will give them their spirit back. That's exactly what's happening in the communities today. Arnold is now watching the jigging bug bite more and more young people looking to explore their heritage. It's good for our whole community, especially good for all our kids who have lacked self-esteem because they were ashamed of who they were. Arnold gets calls every day from people wanting to reconnect to their heritage through jigging. I like to dance for people. There's most of our dancers in the Métis community now uh, are very, very uh, uh, proud of who they are. Do you like being Métis? Mm -hmm. An Inuit woman wanting to see more representation has been putting together a musical using traditional Inuit stories. Julia Davis is an Inuk singer and actress from here in Winnipeg. Now, she quickly gained attention on TikTok for her work, but the music flowed thanks to stories from one person, her grandmother. I won't shy away from open doors. I saw the Northern Lights. I called um, my grandma, and she told me the legend of the Northern Lights. Or do I reach for more? The story that my grandma told me was that if you whistle at the Northern Lights, um, then they'll come down and take you up with them. So I started writing the song and it just kind of kept developing into something more until I was like, I think I could write a musical about this. of people have been you know rediscovering themselves and wanting to share and that's something I kind of got from TikTok. I'm adopted um, so I've always been lucky enough to know my family and know where I come from and, and that kind of inspired me to, to do the same because there were many years where I didn't really feel comfortable. It's just such a, it's a part of me that I'm really proud of. Looking back on the legacy of learning. When I came back here and saw the different types of people that were in this group, I, like, my heart just, like, got so warm. Still to come, how a Vancouver Island woman's efforts to connect with her culture have students of all stripes doing the same thing years later. Plus, reclaiming and rebuilding a traditional mode of transportation. 12-foot canoe, you're looking at anywhere from 600 to 700 feet of prepared route. Building birch bark canoes, helping the next generation paddle their ancestral waterways. Marcy is how you say thank you in Machif. Marcy. Weilaliuk means thank you in Mi'kmaq. Weilaliuk. What started as one Vancouver Island girl's goal to connect with culture has blossomed into a community where indigeneity is centered and celebrated. Cedar Circle sets an example for uplifting indigenous worldviews and the youth who want to share them. CTV's Anna McMillan introduces us to one of those young people looking back on the legacy she left at school. This is all sewing thread. Keelan McNeil can bead, drum, <laughs> tell you about her family history, but it wasn't long ago that she wrote these words about wanting to learn more about her culture. So she did. It was 
very helping and very healing for me. The 18-year-old lives on Vancouver Island, away from her Teltan and Nishka roots on BC's mainland. Because we live so far away from our home territory and from the rest of our family, um, being close to something that was like my culture was very comforting to me. That comfort drawn from a group she helped found at Cedar Hill Middle School in Saanich. Cedar Circle formed around 2016 when conversations about reconciliation were gaining traction. The fact that I never knew about residential schools before those years surprises me and being a third generation of a residential school survivor, that was pretty shocking. Here, students of all stripes celebrate Indigenous cultures. Right. They've made drums. I pulled all of these sinew threads. And learned about Indigenous worldviews. I think since this is their land, um, it's really important to learn about their culture. It's not only a good educational experience, it's really fun. We do lots of cool projects and field trips, and it's just really interesting and cool. Keelan wants to see similar initiatives in every school across Canada. When I came back here and saw the different types of people that were in this group, I like my heart just like got so warm. I was like, wow, because I didn't have that in grade six. Neither did Tyrone Elliott, who is a decade older than Keelan. I was learning about myself through a lens that I didn't really understand or um, think portrayed me very accurately. Now he works as an Indigenous arts and culture facilitator, so today's students have a better experience. Seeing Keelan and how far Keelan has come, that that's kind of the goal of the Indigenous Education Department. Her message to those who want to connect with their culture? I would say do it. Because young Keelan said it best. You cannot be anyone else but you. Anna McMillan, CTV News, Saanich. The Indigenous Peoples Garden in Winnipeg's Assiniboine Park is a place to connect and celebrate a rich history and respect for nature. The gardens were designed in part by David Thomas with the help of his daughter. We caught up with David a year after it opened to find out what it was like to work together on a park for people of all ages. David Thomas has been designing buildings and spaces for Indigenous people for much of his career as an architect, but this space is special to him and his family. So this is my favorite one. The Women's Circle was created with help from many women, including his daughter Cheyenne. It is a space for women and their families to connect while surrounded by nature and Indigenous teachings. Thompson's parents are residential school survivors, and he says they would be proud of their granddaughter Cheyenne's work creating the space. I get too emotional to even start considering how deep it is to me. I can't, I can't really uh, put it in words. It's like overw it overwhelms me to think that we did this. When he visits the space, Thomas says he likes seeing how families interact with it, listening to them wonder out loud about the meanings behind the designs his daughter helped create. Thomas is hopeful the younger generation will pick up the pencil and create Indigenous spaces for future generations to enjoy. Oral history is an extremely important aspect of Indigenous culture. It is seen as a bridge between past, present and future. But for a while it was put away, like many cultural aspects, either hidden or banned through residential schools. According to Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, many Indigenous languages are at risk of being extinct. As CTV's Rita Ismael reports, there are now efforts in place to ensure language isn't lost. They you get a Disney, take, take care of each other. Ursula Dockstader knows the importance of preserving the language her ancestors spoke. Uh, right now we have less than 20 um, fluent speakers. Dockstader says growing up she noticed that her elders didn't value their language, not to a fault of their own, but because that's how they were groomed. It wasn't until she was in college that she realized the importance of keeping their language alive. It hit me like a ton of bricks, like oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? What, are, what, what, what can we do? And um, I thought the first thing we got to do is um, I got I to start trying to learn it myself. And today she advocates for more resources and access to speakers. A lot of efforts being put in to try to revitalize language. Um, we have programming down here from right from like daycare early years all the way to now it's being offered all the way up to um, college level.
Doc Sater says the importance of funding is crucial to ensure that people are able to take the time they need to learn the language. We hear the birds and then all of a sudden there's this gigantic opening where the sun comes up. For knowledge keeper Ray John Jr. language includes ceremonial practices. When we greet the day we know that that is our way of saying thank you. A culture advisor with the Catholic School Board, Ray John says he is working towards changing the views that are currently in place about Indigenous peoples. We have to acknowledge how we got here and that all is stemming from our from our language and if that one part disappears again it's like losing a limb. We can't retrieve that. Ray John says he'd like to see his people's existence prevail, and to do that, they must continue their traditions. Language is so much more. There's a spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical part of it. Rita Ismail, CTV News. It's a traditional mode of transportation with roots that run deep, but building a birch bark canoe from scratch is both a spiritual and physical process. One man from Ontario is passing on his teachings as he travels across the province. CTV's Daryl Morris explains. For Canada's Indigenous peoples, the canoe is a symbol of resilience and a connection to community. For the Eastern Woodlands people, which would have included all of the uh, Anishinaabe tribes, um, that was their main mode of transportation. Chuck Commanda is considered one of the few First Nations people who still practices the art of building birch bark canoes using only cedar wood, spruce needles, and a lot of bark. A 12 foot canoe, you're looking at anywhere from 600 to 700 feet of prepared route. It's not just physical materials involved in the process. The sacred grandfather teachings are a large part of the heritage. There's seven of them, love, wisdom, bravery, courage, humility, honesty, and truth. And I think all Indigenous students and children should learn how to do traditional things like this. It's these lessons Commanda is passing down to Indigenous students in Guelph, Ontario. Learning Indigenous history, learning Indigenous uh, realities today because we don't want people to just be teaching us as peoples of the past. Not only does the school board hope this will help the students stay connected to their roots, Commanda wants to stress the significance of sustainability. To be learning things in a natural way with all of the products that are harvested naturally. Uh, we don't want to go in there and, and harvest everything and take away from the next seven generations. And we've got to keep that, that, those next generations in mind all the time. Armed with a new skill, the next generation now paddles their ancestral waterways, reclaiming and rebuilding a symbol of sovereignty. Daryl Morris, CTV News, Guelph. Art is interwoven through Indigenous cultures, and one young woman from Edmonton is taking that literally. I would say it was probably good timing. I was just looking for some printed meters of my designs, and she was looking to start her project. It's a project three years in the making. A manager of Marshall's Fabrics, a fabrics retailer in Winnipeg, began digging for Indigenous designers to create patterns to sell in stores across Canada. It was difficult to find a designer willing to let their art become a part of someone else's. After months of searching, she connected with Carrie Okama. I'm just so happy that everybody loves my flowers and um, I just really wanted to say like I'm just that young girl that was close to her grandma and really loved what her grandma was doing. And I, and I loved the time I spent with my grandmothers. I would, I would give anything to have them back and I would give anything to show them, you know, look at what I've done. The popular fabrics have been shipped across Canada, Australia and England. The store says after six months, another Indigenous artist will be featured, but they won't have to wait long to see the next design. Since Carrie's Fabric came out, I've had a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls and a lot of people who are interested in working with us to get their, their uh, designs and their artwork on fabric as well. Okuma's designs have caught the eye of shoppers, including this woman who will be using the fabrics to create her first ribbon skirt. It's beautiful and it's amazing that we're finally getting, you know, our artists, um, their work is being recognized and I get to actually buy it. April Blackbird says she's glad to see more and more Indigenous artists in stores. 
saying the younger generation is picking up the sewing needle, reconnecting with their cultures in a modern way. An artist from Big Stone Cree Nation has made reconciliation and the restoration of his culture his life's purpose. Lance Cardinal's work is spreading, popping up in prominent places, each piece a lesson in what was lost with colonization. CTV's Jeff Hastings reports. <laughs> when you see Lance Cardinal, there's a good chance he's laughing <laughs> as he moves from one project. This logo is gonna be on the New Jerseys, which will be premiered this year. To the next. You're testing me. You know I'm not like this. I don't stay still very long. But behind the smile is serious purpose. The time for us uh, to be subtle is over. The time for us to be complacent and to sort of wait around are over. Reconciliation and the restoration of his culture. It took about seven generations for our people to lose our culture. His elders, he says, believe it will take another seven generations to find it again. He considers himself to be the second generation of that journey. Now the focus is on youth, the generations that follow. Hello! <laughs> What's your name? My name is Atticus. I'm an artist too. His co-host on a new TV show he describes as Indigenous Mr. Dress Up. My Casey, per se, Mr. Dress Up Casey, so that's him. Is there a Finnegan? Hello! Yes, Finnegan's down there. Join me on Indigenous Art Adventures. Sharing his art and enthusiasm for his culture with a young national audience. I want to give you a big hug. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've never felt this kind of energy before. His latest work, a mural on a prominent wall at the headquarters of the Catholic School Board in Edmonton. They approached me and said, would you like to have uh, a voice there. You're, you can speak whatever you want. This wall is for you. A lesson for others who sculpt young minds. Every day they're going to see this representation in this space and be reminded that this is Indigenous land that they're on. Lance is learning too. Because time is important, I have to learn and teach and share who I am as I learn. Relentlessly optimistic, he thinks seven generations may not be necessary. It's important for me to push hard, to put murals out, to talk about content, to, to show pictures, to share art, to, to celebrate and yell from the top of the buildings. This is who we are. Let's, you know, let's all come together and celebrate Indigenous culture. It's a beautiful thing. Jeff Hastings, CTV News, Edmonton. We're helping to provide a place where kids can have community. They have something to look forward to. Thank you in Mohawk. Ni hawa. Nekormik is how you say thank you in Ineptitak. Nekormik. A team of Indigenous skateboarders are bringing that sport to First Nations across southern Alberta. They say that the lessons and skills learned while boarding can help Indigenous youth navigate today's world. The group tours Treaty 7 reserves with their mobile skate park, giving kids a chance to hone their skills. CTV's Kevin Green caught up with the group as they set up on the Susina First Nation just outside Calgary. Falling down and getting back up again. There's a lot of that in learning to skateboard. That builds resiliency, says the team behind the nonprofit Cousins Skateboarding. Right here, right here. Come on. You can do which it. Which brings mobile skate parks to reserves in southern Alberta. Here he comes, here he comes. What we're doing is we're helping to provide a place where kids can have community. They have something to look forward to. It's consistent. They know that this is a safe place. And what that creates in them, I mean, our hope ultimately is that skateboarding empowers them the same way it empowered us. There are no skate parks on any Treaty 7 nation. To address that, Cousins bought this mobile skate park from the city of Calgary. On this day, it's set up on the Tsutina First Nation. Skater Miles Rabbit loves being able to board on his home turf. And sometimes we would have to go in town or town, a town skate park. We're not really used to going out there just meeting random people and because at the same time we get, we're shy. We're shy and, well, some of us are. Well, I'm one of them. For youth like Miles, this skate park is a place to test themselves, to grow and to do it without judgment. What I see here is just a sense of belonging and a sense of um, encouragement to push their boundaries. 
and to just feel accepted. I think youth, they don't think about reconciliation, they just participate and they just want to feel included. Look at you, look at you going. Reconciliation is on the minds of the crew from Cousins who say they drew inspiration from the story of Joe Buffalo, a residential school survivor who went on to become a professional skateboarder, an actor and an advocate for inclusion. By including everyone, by making sure it's, it's um, an inclusive space, if those things happen, reconciliation becomes a natural byproduct. Ultimately, the crew at Cousins say skateboarding is a metaphor for the kind of resilience Indigenous youth need to build in today's world. When these kids are hitting the ground, they don't really care what's going on before this. They don't care what's going on after this. They just care about getting up and trying it again, if they can. <laughs> but we're always there to pick them up. Kevin Green, CTV News, on the Sutina First Nation. We've heard incredible stories of resilience over the last hour and seen the determination of a generation hopeful about what the future holds. And we've met young leaders who are holding the memory of the atrocity generations before them experienced and are forging a new path forward. And we've heard of ways we can make a difference and take bolder steps to achieve reconciliation. Thank you for watching Reconciliation and Reconnecting the Path Forward, a CTV News National Day for Truth and Reconciliation special.